Tyler, and good morning, church. Um, by the way, for those ladies, if you've signed up, we're going to be meeting right below this room in the dining hall, and um, I'll be sending you an email, though, this week just to let you know a few more details. I cannot wait to see you all there. It has been a while, right? It's been a while, and that's the thing. Between the sun this morning and your faces out here, my heart, <gasps> and my hair, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, my parents are here. Sorry, thanks a lot. <laughs> I haven't, they haven't been here since last March. Oh my goodness, y'all. Thank God that he has been so faithful to us. Amen. Ain't nothing coming against his kingdom. So, um, by the way, I'm Cami Shelatz, and um, again, so, so glad, to, uh, delighted to be here with you. We get to come together and worship. We get to gather without fear, without worrying about um, anything that might happen to us because we do so. We're going to be talking about some people today that that, isn't, that hasn't always been the case. Um, before we get into that, I uh, just wanted to thank, there were a whole pass of people who came out yesterday and helped with the spring workday here at the church. Please, would you thank them? It's hugely, hugely appreciated and a ginormous help. So thank you very, very much for those of you who did that. Um, and second, before we get into the message, just want to, especially if you're online, um, but even here, hang with us to the end of the service. The elders have um, another succession update for us. So just, just stay, stay with us for that. All right, I'm going to pray before we get started. God, our hearts are full this morning, and it is because you are with us. You have given us your Holy Spirit, and there is nothing greater than coming into your presence, being surrounded by your people, and lifting high our praises. You are worthy. So God, we thank you so much this morning that we could do that. Thank you for the body of Christ, not only who gathers here, but around the world. What a privilege. What a privilege to be sons and daughters of the King. And Lord, now as we turn our hearts to hear from and consider your word, we ask that you would illuminate, to, illuminate, it, us, <laughs> illuminate it to us. Grow us, God, deep. Give us a greater sense of who you are and who we are called to be because of what you've done for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, did you ever have like a hair on you and you knew it was there and you're just working and working to get, I have one of those right now. I don't really know where it is and I can't get it off. So if you see me, ah, okay, sorry. This morning we are starting into a brand new sermon series called Going Viral. But the kind of, go very timely, right? Ooh. The going viral, though, that we're going to be talking about today and in the coming weeks happened way before the internet or YouTube. From pretty much day one of the birth of the church, there was significant opposition and persecution on several fronts. And on top of that, Christians had virtually no power and very few resources, and yet the church thrived. It went viral. And interestingly, that's exactly what is happening and what has happened in other areas of the world where Christians are being persecuted. The church is booming. Why? How is that possible? Well, to help us answer those questions, we're going to be spending some time in the letters of First and Second Peter to see how those young believers persevered and stayed faithful to their calling in spite of everything that came against them. So if you have your Bibles or your devices with you, I invite you to join me in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. We're actually going to read the first 12 verses, um, even though we will never get to them all in detail this morning, not even close. Martin is actually going to dig into some of them uh, more next week. But the reason I want to read them all right now is because the chunk, if you will, from verse 3 to verse 12, though we don't see it in our English translations, it's actually one massive run-on sentence. 
So, it, it, I mean, to me, it just doesn't make any sense to stop right in the middle of it. Um, and I know, I would imagine, at least, that uh, for a lot of you grammar geeks, of whom I am one, uh, you know, a sentence like that long might make you, you know, just cringe a little bit. But one commentator had this to say about the passage. Peter's grammar is wonderfully elegant, as well as profoundly expressive of the grandeur of his subject, salvation. Also, I've said it before, and I will say it again, without apology, it's never not important. Did you like that double negative, right? That's good too, grammatically. It is always really, really important that we get as much context as we can so that we might best understand and apply God's word to our own lives. So let's read it. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Okay, so this is where the run-on sentence starts right now. I'm going to take one breath and do it all. I'm just kidding. I'm just... Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. That was one sentence. That's crazy, right? <laughs> so first things first. Peter is the one who wrote and sent this letter. And that's an important detail as we work our way through what the Spirit inspired him to write. So consider this. It's a very silly example, but it illustrates my point well. Imagine you get a text today, and it's from Jesus, and it says, I'm coming to get you. Or imagine you get a text from Satan today that says, I'm coming to get you. Right? It matters that we know who wrote it, right? It's going to totally make a difference in how we interpret it, how we prepare, right? It matters. It matters who is speaking or writing in this case. It totally colors our perspective and our interpretation. So the letter is from Peter. What do we know about him? Well, he was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, so think blue collar. He was personally called by Jesus to follow him. He was a leader among the disciples, one of Jesus' three closest friends. He was the first among the 12 disciples to recognize and then proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah. He saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain as well as Moses and Elijah, who miraculously appeared at the same time. He tried to walk on water. Didn't do so bad at first, right? Got a little, little shaky there at the end. His mother-in-law was healed by Jesus, so we know he was married. 
So there's a ton more that can be gleaned from Peter, about Peter, from the Gospels and the book of Acts, but the point is, is that Peter was a real guy with real history with Jesus, and that not only colors what he writes, but it impacts us as well. But perhaps the most important aspect as we read and interpret his letter is the evolution of Peter's own understanding and acceptance of Jesus' death. When Jesus explained to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 that he was going to Jerusalem to suffer and die, Peter was incredulous, and he gets up in Jesus' face to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then, when all of it did start happening right in front of their eyes in Jerusalem, uh, right after that last Passover meal together, Peter denied even knowing Jesus three times. I just, I cannot imagine the weight of his sorrow and regret. And then his profound gratitude for Jesus' gracious forgiveness and restoration that we read about in John chapter 21. But then we see in the book of Acts and in these two letters of First and Second Peter, this complete about face in him, right? He not only preaches the necessary and God-ordained death and vindication of Jesus, he affirmed that as disciples, we're meant to follow in his steps, suffering right alongside him, even if it means death. For Peter, Jesus' death and resurrection was the hinge point and became the very foundation of the rest of his life. Everything he did, everything he wrote revolved around that central history and life-altering reality. It's also no small detail how Peter chooses to describe himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. As an apostle, Peter, Peter was an integral leader at the inception of the New Testament church after Pentecost, delivering some of the most powerful and comprehensive, sermon, comprehensive sermons that we have preserved for us during one of the most critical times in the church's history. By definition, an apostle meant that he was specifically chosen and commissioned by Jesus himself to represent him and to be an authoritative messenger and interpreter of the gospel. So when he writes this letter, there's some weight behind it. I love how one commentator put it. He said, Peter's letter is to be seen not as the pious opinions of a well-wishing friend, but as the authoritative word of one who speaks for the Lord of the church himself. And so, from my reading this past week, um, from what I understand, there's, interestingly, some disagreement among scholars as to how best to translate and interpret those to whom Peter wrote. There are many who tend to kind of gloss over Peter's literal intended recipients and very quickly jump to metaphorically apply his message to all Christians everywhere, including us, because we're all ultimately sojourners, just passing through this life on our way to heaven, aliens and strangers in the world, as Peter writes in the second chapter, verse 11. Now, to be sure, there is absolutely place, a, a place for that interpretation. And the pilgrimage theme is one that we find all throughout the New Testament. But what's important for us to understand first is that when Peter sat down to write this letter, he wasn't thinking, well now, what should I say to all the Christians who will ever live through all the coming millennia? <laughs> I mean, he, he wasn't thinking that way. He was writing to current, in his day, Christ followers, primarily Gentiles probably, but also some Jews, maybe even people he could picture in his mind because he had met them, people who were scattered throughout the regions that he listed, suffering very real persecution. It wasn't a theoretical 
or a metaphorical thing by any stretch of the imagination. Peter was writing during the reign of Nero, who was arguably one of, if not the most infamous Roman emperors of all time. He was horrendously cruel and violent with most of the outrageous atrocities he committed directed toward Christ followers. Now again, since this is the inerrant and eternal word of God, living and active, it is absolutely meant for us but we cannot rightly understand and apply it to our lives until and unless we first rightly understand what it meant and how it applied to the lives of the people to whom it was first written. Does that make sense? You know, we're often just so quick to open up our Bibles to see what's in it for me. I need a word from God right here and right now. But we blow past almost disregarding the reasons and the people to and for whom it was all first written. And that's not at all a good habit to get into when it comes to understanding and applying the living Word of God. So Peter's writing this letter, Peter the Apostle, with quite a significant testimony, and I only mentioned a few of the things um, that are, that are you know, significant about his life. After he was writing, uh, he was writing to Christ's followers who were living in very challenging, very dangerous times. Many of the people who heard this letter read out loud, because that's typically the way that worked. You know, these were sent to the churches, and they read them out loud, and they shared them among one another. A lot of those people likely knew someone who was killed for their faith. They maybe even witnessed it. They likely knew someone who would face very real persecution, possibly death, for their faith. They may even face persecution and death themselves, like later that day, or the next day, or the day after that. I mean, it was real in their face. So just like many of us probably would, you know, they no doubt wondered how do we do this? Peter, how do we stand firm? How are we to live in light of the daily reality that we could suffer horribly in all kinds of different ways simply because we love and follow Jesus? And that is a very key distinction for us to remember as we read the letter of 1 Peter. Peter is not writing to Christians who were walking through the typical storms of life As painful and challenging as they may be, he was writing to Christians who were suffering precisely because of the faith they proclaimed. So let's get into it. So have you ever gotten a letter or an email or a text from somebody, right, that you were looking forward to? Perhaps it was in response to some questions that you asked or some help or advice that you needed. And when you get it, you just kind of want to breeze through the, hi, how you doing? It was so good to hear you. You know, kind of all that fluff. And you want to get to the good stuff, right? Blah, blah, blah. Just tell me what I need to know. (laughs) Well, it may have been very tempting for Peter's recipients to want to blow through his greeting and introduction too. Even the time he took to offer praise to God for what has been done for and given to them in Christ. But that would have been a grave mistake. Because here's the thing, all of the practical stuff that Peter writes about, all the do this and don't do this when you suffer for being a Christian, and there's a lot of it in First and Second Peter, all of it is pointless, meaningless, powerless, without the firm, immovable, unshakable, unalterable foundation of who God is and of the salvation that is ours in Christ and what that means for us. So listen again to the first two verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Talk about a theologically jam-packed hello! <laughs> Look at all the things he reminds them of. They are God's elect chosen by him. 
And what that means is that the grace they had received was entirely because of God's initiative. In other words, God called them to his love and grace. God prompted their faith through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. God claimed their allegiance to Jesus Christ because of what he accomplished for them on the cross. Peter was summarizing the gospel, the message of salvation, and notice how he gets all three persons of the Trinity in there, right? The the Christians to whom Peter was writing were effectively called by the Father They were spiritually made holy by the Holy Spirit, and they were set apart for obedience to Jesus because of the forgiveness that he purchased for them with his shed blood. It's critical to recognize that though salvation is entirely by God's initiative, it does require our response, right? Just because God first chooses us doesn't mean that we don't also need to choose him. And when we do, we can't help but obey because we understand the implications and we're grateful for what he's done for us. And all of that grace, as far as Peter was concerned, is to be a source of incredible joy and comfort and encouragement and peace. How can it not be? Peter goes on, nearly bursting with praise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And there it is. Circle it, underline it, highlight it, do whatever you need to do to remember every time you come to this letter that that is the foundation of everything else Peter writes. In Peter's mind, and you see it all throughout the letter, the reason those believers could and would stand firm was because they were saved through faith by the blood of Jesus Christ. He just goes on and on and on about it through the whole run-on sentence all the way to the end of verse 12. And I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but I want to encourage you to go home today and read Peter's letter all in one sitting. It's, that's how it's meant to be read, right? It's a letter. It's only five chapters, so it won't take you long. But what you'll hear as you read it, what I want you to do is is just be mindful of hearing those same themes running throughout the entire thing. Salvation through Jesus Christ changes everything. Peter couldn't possibly get into the mechanics of the Christian life, if you will, and how to endure persecution for their faith without laying the foundation of why their obedience and their perseverance was called for and worth it in the first place. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Oh man, there is so much in that one little sentence. Salvation is a gift of God's mercy. Because we were born dead in our transgressions and sins, we were helpless to save ourselves. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And we couldn't do that for ourselves. In merciful compassion, God made a way for that to be possible. All of God's goodness to us begins with mercy. I found this quote from Charles Spurgeon that I just love. He's speaking of God's mercy. He said, No other attribute could have helped us had mercy been refused. As we are by nature, justice condemns us, holiness frowns upon us, power crushes us, truth confirms the threatening of the law, and wrath fulfills it. It is from the mercy of our God that all our hopes begin. 
hope. Our salvation is our hope. And Scripture uses the word hope way differently than the way we use it. Typically, we use the word hope when we're referring to uncertainties. Like, we might say that we hope it isn't cloudy and gray tomorrow, but because we live in Western PA, we know that that is very probably not going to be the case. We can't read that kind of hope into the Scriptures. When the apostles wrote of our hope in Christ, they didn't mean that our hope is uncertain. In Scripture, hope is the complete confidence God's people have in the fulfillment of every single one of His promises. Biblical hope is absolute certainty because God is incapable of breaking His word to us. No other hope that we may have is more secure than the hope of salvation promised to everyone who trusts in Christ alone. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We just don't have hope. We have living hope. The hope of salvation is not dead, but it is alive and active. It has sustaining power that manifests itself in faith for this present moment and every single moment to come. The author of Hebrews tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. How can we be sure? How can we have living hope? Because Jesus is alive. That is the foundation of our faith and hope. Paul, who was another apostle, had significant influence, influence and impact on Peter's life and faith. And he also wrote of these same things in the letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth. He said, if Christ has not been raised, I mean, listen, this is, this is it. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. I mean, that's it. Hinge point. Again, he says in verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Christ rising from the dead is everything. Living hope, firmly rooted in the salvation that we have in Christ, is precious. It's priceless, especially for believers who are living in the midst of persecution, not knowing if they would live to see another day. Peter assured them that their new birth didn't just give them a hope, a living hope, for this life. No, he said they had living hope and a coming inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So basically, Peter was saying, even if you die a martyr, and some of them would, what they had waiting for them because of their salvation could never, ever be taken away from them. Again, Paul wrote so many similar things. It's like they both loved and followed the same risen Savior, right? (laughs) And they were contemporaries, actually. They were writing letters and doing their thing at the same time, Paul and Peter. So this is what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And so again, listen for the same words and themes. In him, he wrote, meaning Christ, we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in, the, in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. 
Peter, I'm sorry, Paul also wrote to the church in Philippi, in Philippi that for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. So in other words, I have living hope now. I have living hope then. My life is sealed in Christ. So what can man do to me? Right? No matter what way you cut it, it's always a win-win. And I truly don't mean to minimize or trivialize the magnitude of the suffering of the persecuted church. But look, Paul, who wrote it, knew persecution up close and personal, beaten, flogged, stoned and left for dead multiple times, but still he wrote, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Living hope. Now and forever, because salvation in Christ is secure, through faith we are shielded by God's power. He holds us fast, no matter who or what may come against us. And that living hope was to be their anchor. It was to be their true north as they faced daily the opposition that was coming against them because of their faith. But more than that, Peter wrote, in this salvation, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had, had, had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls, living hope because of their glorious salvation. That's what Peter points them to and reminds them of before he even begins to talk about how to live a life of holiness and obedience in the midst of persecution. And now we too have laid the foundation for what we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. So if Peter was writing to Christians 2,000 years ago from a completely different culture who were suffering serious persecution for their faith, does his letter really have anything much at all to say to us? That's a fair and good question to ask. It does. We just have to be really careful in how we apply it to our lives right now because we are not experiencing yet what was a daily reality for them. And as I prayed about how we could apply this to our lives, I felt the Spirit just kind of led my mind and heart to three ways we can learn from and respond to what Peter was, has written. First, you can pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. You know, if you Google persecuted church, you'll easily see three or four organizations right off the bat, Voice of the Martyrs being one of the best, um, that will keep you informed and help you pray very specifically for those who are suffering and dying for their faith in Jesus every single day in the world. And second, and I debated this, but I finally decided that I wanted to read directly um, from one of the resources that I read in preparing for this morning. It was too good not to. I read it and was like, oh, that kind of hurt. <laughs> he did not mince any words. This is what he wrote. His name is Scott McKnight. He said, I begin by contending that our lack of suffering for our faith is in part due to a lack of nerve on the part of the church to challenge our contemporary world with the message of the cross and to live according to the teachings of Jesus with uncompromising vigor. 
While the Bible never states that every Christian of every age will always suffer, Paul does state in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I take this to be not an absolute prediction of, what, of Paul for all ages, but a general principle that is rooted in the nature of a fallen world, the kind of statement made so often in Proverbs. As a guiding principle, then, those who live faithful lives in an unbelieving world will find opposition both to their ideas and their practices. In other words, I am arguing that suffering, while it may not be as much a part of the everyday fabric of our lives as it was when Peter was writing, should probably be more a part of our lives than it is. I contend that one of the reasons the living out of our faith generates so few sparks is because the fires of commitment and unswerving confession of the truth of the gospel are too frequently set on low flame as if the church grows best if it only simmers rather than boils. Accordingly, in the last thought that I'm going to read from him, he says, one of the reasons it's hard to apply this feature of 1 Peter to our world is our own problem. We should not then accuse the text of being hopelessly irrelevant. We can only accuse ourselves of being dormant and sleepy. I had to sit in that one for a little while. It's very, very convicting. Third and last. Y'all, I don't mean to be too dramatic, and I don't, I'm no expert in anything, but I don't think we're going to have the luxury of being dormant and sleepy much longer. The way the culture seems to be so rapidly progressing and many of the directions that it's going is going to have major implications for us as Christ followers as we learn how to respond and stand firm in our faith. I think the big book of 1 Peter is going to become way more relevant for us than we might realize. And so I urge you, church, to pray. Pray for one another. Pray for Four Mile Church that we might be so thankful for our living hope because of our salvation that we burst with praise and that we are faithful to our calling to suffer along with Christ for the sake of the gospel and the glory of his name. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you right now for Peter. We thank you, God, that you used him in such mighty and profound ways to have such an impact on the church that even today he ministers to us and he speaks to us through your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that you have sustained the church throughout all the ages amidst everything and everyone who has come against those who profess your name up to this very day. And we do very much, Lord, want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering around the world because they love you. We ask, God, that you would strengthen them, that you would ignite the fire of the living hope that is within them because they are saved. Help them to keep their eyes on the inheritance that is waiting for them. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would teach us and help us to know how we too are to live in a world that is completely opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we do it well. May we do it for your glory. And may you be exalted as the God and King that you are. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good word for today, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. I want to um, just take a moment and, you know, it seems like... Uh, Surprising. Four, four months ago, or over four months ago, you met as a congregation and affirmed um, the search team and elders' recommendation to hire and call David Lau as the next 
uh, lead pastor here at Four Mount. And that was a combination of a discussion actually that started with the elders back in 2016. And so I just want to update you where things are and what they're looking like. And uh, the elders are going to come up and give you some of the details of that, whoever that is. Come on up. Josh is going to come up. But while he's coming up, I just want to let you know that Sunday, May 23rd, will be uh, the last time that I preach here at Four Mile as lead pastor. So that's kind of a, a time stamp on, on the process of things. And they're here to give you whoever's going to come up. Yeah, as they're coming, let's just thank them. They've done an awesome job. You've got a tremendous group of, of leaders. So. Yeah, as Martin mentioned, uh, May 23rd will be his final sermon. Um, and then just for information, in between until David starts August 1st, uh, Cami will be filling in and preaching those Sundays. Um, but in, in light of that, um, I mean, Martin's been a strong leader and a faithful leader to this church community. Um, he's impacted each of our lives in many different ways. So now it's time to celebrate him. So on May 23rd, um, we just ask you to mark your calendars to come out. We're going to have a celebration and a lunch just to honor him and Lori and how they faithfully have served here. Um, so again, mark your calendars. Make every priority to be here. Um, there's also going to be a letter coming out this week, um, just highlighting some of those details and some of the things that we're asking you to partake in. And then May 30th, uh, we're going to have a service that kind of signifies the transition and just highlights some of those things. Um, both Martin and David will be here, and then following that, we'll uh, have a get-together, spend some time, and just enjoy one other com each other's company. So, again, uh, we're thankful for you as a church. We're excited to see what's ahead and just want to honor and celebrate Martin and what he's done for us as a church.